Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, some ancient platypus ancestors have been discovered in Australia, a giant Jurassic pterosaur has been found, crows have been found to count like humans, and much more. Starting off the news this week, scientists have been able to determine the chemical properties of the incredibly rare element Promethium. Promethium, having been theorised beforehand, was discovered in 1945 during the Manhattan Project, the programme behind the scientific development of the nuclear bomb during the Second World War by the USA, Britain and Canada. It was, naturally, named after the titan Prometheus from ancient Greek mythology, a figure who was responsible for giving humankind the spark of civilization when he defied the king of the gods and granted them the secret behind the creation of fire. The element Prometheus has had no such effect on our species, and is very hard to study because of how unstable it is. In fact, at any given time, only about 500 grams of the stuff exists within Earth's crust at all. It is not insanely difficult to manufacture, and is actually often created as a byproduct of the radioactive decay of uranium. What the scientists of this study have been able to do, publishing their work in the journal Nature, is form a compound of promethium and surrounded this compound with water. This means that for the first time ever, they were able to study many of its chemical properties, such as the length of the bonds it created with the atoms around it. This was done using X-ray spectroscopy, a process that basically involves firing X-rays at the target and then seeing which frequencies are absorbed by the target. One scientist called the previous lack of knowledge about Prometheum a glaring gap for all of science, as Prometheum was previously the only lanthanite metal not to have had its chemical properties studied. An important chemical study then, and knowing more about this element will help in its manufacture and could help in the development of future technologies that can now utilise Prometheum with a greater understanding. In other news, we're going back to Venus yet again as a study published in the journal Nature has received some information gathered in the early 1990s by NASA's Magellan spacecraft, which was a probe sent to map the surface of Venus and get some close readings of its gravitational field. Recent scholarship has suggested that Venus might be more volcanic in the present day than had previously been thought, and this study presented further evidence to back up this claim, observing a wider array of changes in the planet's surface morphology that suggests new lava flows. This particular set of volcanic activity potentially observed would have actually taken place during Magellan's mapping of Venus, meaning that if this is indeed volcanic activity observed, it would confirm that Venus is a geologically active planet in the present day. While this study cannot outright confirm that its observations conclusively reveal present day volcanic activity on Venus, it is an important piece of additional evidence to further support this idea. The previous study that suggested it may have observed the aftermath of volcanic activity on Venus was published in 2023, and both of these studies say that Venus could have a level of volcanic activity that was similar to that of Earth's. This is an incredibly important study in adding yet more evidence to this idea, and the combination of both of these observations will no doubt encourage further scholarship on the current volcanic activity of Venus and may even influence the instrumentation and observational focus of planned missions to our sister planet. Also in the news this week, an amazing study has shown that crows are able to count out loud, a skill that is often challenging even for young humans. The researchers designed an experiment in which three carrying crows that had already been taught to call on command would associate a visual cue with a number of calls they wanted them to produce going from one to four calls. Then they had to peck at a key on a touchscreen monitor when they were finished and were rewarded with food if they did the task correctly. The scientists found that the crows were correct most of the time and realized that they could predict the number of calls the birds were going to make as the sound of the first call was different depending on how many they were making, meaning that the crows planned ahead. And they remember faces, don't they? Yeah, they know. They're, they know who wronged them. them. It's a good thing we're all nice to crows here. However, they did also sometimes still make mistakes, sometimes producing more or fewer calls than it seemed like they had planned based on the sound of their first call. And so they were likely losing count of how many they meant to make. Neuroscientists have explained that what the crows are doing is not technically true counting, since they don't actually understand the symbolism of numbers. 
but they say that it might be an evolutionary precursor of that ability. It's a fascinating paper exploring the biological origins of numerical abilities in animals and showing how smart these birds are. First up in the paleontology news this week is the wonderful announcement of the discovery of three new species of ancient platypus relatives from Australia. I love platypuses. These animals are all monotremes, the order of mammals that still lay eggs and include the living platypus and echidnas. The new species were all found in the Lightning Ridge opal fields in New South Wales and lived between about 100 and 96.6 million years ago, while dinosaurs were still dominant. These fossils all come from the lower jaws and are incredibly rare. They have also been opalized during their preservation, giving them a remarkable appearance. The first of the three new species is named Opalios splendens, and it seems to represent a monotreme that evolved before the major split between the echidnas and the platypus. Being described by paleontologists as having its overall anatomy probably quite like the platypus, but with features of the jaw and snout a bit more like an echidna. So, as they say, you might call it an echidnopus. The second species is named Daragara aurora, and this species has only three molars instead of the five seen in Opalios, documenting the gradual reduction in dentition from the toothy ancestor to the almost entirely toothless monotremes of today. The third new species is Parvopallus clytii, now one of the smallest known monotremes, and it again had only three molars. Only three species of monotremes have been previously known from the Lightning Ridge fauna, and so these three new species double the recorded diversity of these mammals from this time and actually making it the most diverse assemblage of fossil monotremes that we know about. The paleontologists also think that they may have solved an interesting evolutionary mystery too. Adult platypuses are toothless, but juveniles still retain basic molars, and this switch to being mostly toothless seems to have happened relatively geologically recently, since toothed platypus relatives have been found as recently as about 5 million years ago. This means that the platypus lineage retained their molar teeth for around 95 million years but then at some point in the last 5 million years were highly reduced. Well, the researchers now think it could have something to do with the arrival of the Australian water rat within the last couple of million years, which is a similar size to the platypus and therefore may have been competing with it for similar food sources. The platypus lineage may have therefore changed their diet to feed on softer prey to avoid competition, no longer needing their molar teeth and instead using horny pads to process food. Lots of interesting monotreme designs discoveries in this paper then. Also in the news, a fantastic new study has confirmed that a site in Patagonia records the KPG extinction event, when a massive asteroid collided with the planet and caused the extinction of the non-bird dinosaurs. Most of the localities that record this event are in the northern hemisphere and at generally low latitudes, but this new site in Chilean Patagonia provides a great new opportunity to study the end Cretaceous event at high southern latitudes. The researchers identified a layer of iridium enrichment consistent with the impact, as this element is rare on Earth but abundant in meteorites, and they showed a significant disturbance in the environment marked by the microscopic spore and plant fragment record. So a very cool paper confirming that this site can now be used to investigate the effects of the impact on this part of the planet. Up next in the paleo news, an exciting discovery from Oxfordshire in England has uncovered one of the largest known examples of a Jurassic pterosaur. It came from a gravel pit that exposed the late Jurassic aged Kimmeridge clay formation and is almost 150 million years old. The fossil is a partial finger bone that would have supported the wing of this pterosaur, and it's been estimated to measure at least three meters in wingspan. Pterosaurs in the Jurassic period did not get to the giant sizes they later achieved in the Cretaceous, rarely growing to wingspans of more than three meters, and so this large finger bone is a significant discovery. Paleontologists have identified it as coming from a tenochasmatoid, which includes the amazing suspension-feeding tenochasmatids, as well as others. Did I say that right? Yes! Significantly, this means that it's also a pterodactyloid, the more derived or advanced major grouping of these flying reptiles, and is therefore one of the first of these kinds of pterosaurs to be reported from the Jurassic of the UK. So another very exciting discovery. And by one of our lecturers? No, yeah. a couple of them. A couple of them, nice. 
And finally for the news this week, a study has looked at how saber-toothed cats processed food as babies. It's a complementary study to the one we covered a few weeks ago, suggesting that Smilodon went through a double saber-toothed stage and includes the author of that paper. I'm so jealous. Was it Doug that covered that? I think it was. Yeah. <sighs> when I get my hands on him, I wanted to cover that one. In this new one, the researchers investigated the changes in anatomy and stress bearing in 49 mandibles from Smilodon fatalis, modern lions and early branching felids at various growth stages. Lions and saber-tooths were both found to show a change in mandibular shape correcting to the eruption of the lower carnassial, a modified back tooth seen in many carnivores that allows for efficient shearing of flesh. This change marks the end of the weaning period in living lions. Interestingly, this period was found to be delayed in Smilodon, indicating that they had a prolonged weaning period and therefore were cared for by their parents for longer. Younger Smilodon individuals were also found to have low biting efficiency, and it was only at a later age that the biting performance became more efficient, again suggesting an extended period of parental care in these saber-toothed cats. Some very interesting results, and also pretty cute to think that these fearsome cats must have been taking very good care of their cubs. Well, that's it for the news this week. I hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Also, be sure to go follow our TikTok and Instagram accounts if you like for more paleontological news updates and short form videos about various extinct animals. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.